Thank you, Jared. Uh, so I'm Gonzalo. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Gonzalo. I'm product owner at uh, APX. Uh, APX is a reg tech company. And me and my colleague, Peter, which is our data engineer, we are here to present to you our new knowledge graph product. First of all, let's start by explaining our business. What do we actually do at APX? APX is the one global hub for digital regulations. So we try to offer digital compliance in a radically simple way. We, we remove complexity out of regulations and we make it accessible to everyone. How do we do this? We do this by having uh, content partners that will provide to us country manuals that are then digitalized into decision trees that we more commonly call rules. And these rules uh, are basically, uh, basically legal text. And this legal text is uh, on the decision trees. So the decision trees, each column of these decision trees is represented by a, a regulatory property. The input that we receive will answer to the questions of these regulatory properties until we achieve a final node. The final node will tell you if you are compliant or not. And if you are not compliant, we'll tell you the reason and what steps need to be taken in order to become compliant. We realized that these rules that we were creating are quite complex because they are based on legal tasks, Regulatory content and regulatory content can have different interpretations, can change across different jurisdictions, so it's very subjective. So we had to create a new service in order to store this information in a way that is consistent and organized. That's where we created our new service called Taxonomy. This is an example of a rule that we have at APX. Uh, so on the left, you can see that this is a rule about data protection topic. It's applicable to Ireland. And uh, the blue part of the image is actually the decision tree, or as, as I said before, the rule. And this rule in this rule, you can see two columns, which represent regulatory properties. And the nodes will tell you more detail. And this detail is actually legal text that is inserted by our regulatory engineers. On the right side, you can see these details and this legal text information. Now, looking from a different perspective, we can we are now from the perspective of the taxonomy service. So someone from our regulatory engineering team created this entry and an entry in taxonomy is actually a term or a concept. The terms have some core fields that need to be filled. The term ID, which is like an identifier, the jurisdiction, which will tell you to where this term is actually applicable. In this case, it's global because it's equally applicable to all the countries the same way. And then you have an owner. In this case, it's APX that owns the term. Finally, you have the de definition in the bottom that will describe this piece of information. So we realized quickly that we could go a bit further, right? So we could try to analyze this information, to understand this information and not looking at the pieces of information in, in a very isolated way. We could try to highly link them. We could try to uh, understand the context and extract the knowledge from this information that we could then provide to the customers. That's why we don't call to this service taxonomy anymore, and we now call it the regulatory knowledge graph. And the goal of the regulatory knowledge graph is to create a repository of regulatory knowledge that will combine the APX know-how and other existing external legal sources. APX know-how, of course, is introduced by our regulatory engineering team. And external legal sources can be anything that could extract from where we could extract some information that can then be integrated into our graph, a legal document, an external ontology, anything. 
We decided to use a graph database, but I think it's very important to explain why to use a graph database. And here we identified four main reasons. The first one is that it focuses on relationships. So on the relational database, you have containers for the nodes, but on the graph databases, relationships are also quite important. So it's very easy to traverse patterns of relations introduce information in the relations and this was one of uh, the main advantages it's quite friendly because it's easier to understand the model in a graph database if things are very complex and highly linked it's very difficult to track that in a relational database in the graph databases we can see that much easier and uh, have a, a, a better idea of the of the model that we are creating the third reason was the performance. Performance, uh, it's very linear. Um, so you can traverse uh, several re relations and the cost keeps linear. But on the relational databases, every time you do a join because you want to cross information from different tables, the cost of that operation gets higher and higher. Last but not least, we have a flexible schema on, on the graph databases. So we don't need to try to anticipate and to predict uh, what kind of questions we will need to answer we, with the graph. If you have the right information on your graph, you can answer to any kind of questions. So here in this image we have a small sample of our uh, neo4j uh, database you can see already uh, some nodes different colors because they have been assigned with different labels uh, some relations that we support uh, and it's just for you to have already an idea of how it looks like but my colleague peter will explain in more detail later We think that it's important to explain the path uh, that we have been going to to choose the technology. So we started with MongoDB, uh, but we realized that our data was really highly linked. So our data was really graph oriented and was very difficult to track this uh, amount of relationships in a database as MongoDB. That's why we discarded. Then we tried Stardog which uh, is more is not a full graph database it's more a triple store which is simpler but not suitable for all the businesses so the data is very atomic it's based on object subject and predicates which uh, build the nodes and uh, and the edges but this uh, was requiring a lot of pre and post processing on our services in order to execute complex changes that's why we discarded this option we tried Yanus Graph. It uses Gremlin as a main graph query language, but is not so powerful and flexible as Cypher. It, it was not allowing at that time properties on relationships, which for us was important. And the community is quite reduced, so it was difficult to find people with the same issues that we had. Finally, we end up with Neo4j, which uh, focus on the nodes, but also on the edges. So we, you have containers of information for both. You can introduce any kind of properties on nodes, but also on edges. You have an embedded graph visualization where, where you can explore, expand your nodes and uh, go through the graph and quickly understand and have a, an overview of your model. It uses Cypher as a main query language, uh, which is very, very powerful and it has a huge community, so it's very easy to, to find out people with the same issues that we have. Now I will pass to my colleague Peter, that will give a bit more detail about our data model. Yes, hello. So um, thanks, Gonzalo. Um, so now I will tell you a bit more details how we model the data, how we use Neo4j um, to support our knowledge graph and the information that we provide there. So first, let's start with a um, with an example, uh, a simple example that we 
we saw already the, the, the trees that we built, the digital roots. So this is again a tree from our data protection product. And you can see that we have to go through several steps to find out if we can process data or not. And one example that we will show now is um, from the second step here, establishment limb. So um, this is the concept that we will now have a closer look at. Um, here you can see on the right hand side again, the user interface, how the user enters the information for this um, concept establishment limb. Gonzalo already explained that we have a term, a term ID. You can see that the term ID is derived from the term in this case. This not, needs not to be the case, but often it is, it is the case. Um, and we, you can see also that we have an additional ID at the bottom. So this is the ID that is really unique. And the term ID uh, needs not to be unique. We will see some examples and how we use this. So the term ID specify, specifies a specific concept. Uh, but we have can have several entries in our knowledge graph under this term ID. We will see later. On the left hand side, um, you can see how this looks in our data model. Very simple. We have a node for the concept, and we can see already two relations that we use here for the jurisdiction and the translation. On the next slide, um, you can see how, for example, this works for the translations. We have one translation here one relationship for the translation, which is called has translation. And the user can then add more translations for French or German. And the um, new 4 j data model would have more of those has translation relations. Here you can see an example now uh, for a concept that has several um, definitions but with the same term ID. So now we are talking about an establishment. What is the definition of an establishment? And the definition of an establishment depends on the jurisdiction. For example, the United States has a different um, definition for establishment than Mexico or other countries. And here's how we um, represent this in our, in our data model. So you can see that the same term ID um, links to several jurisdictions. Uh, for example, for Mexico, we have two establishments. Um, and this is uh, several definitions that we have for the Mexican jurisdiction. So the other thing that we represent here is the owner of the term. So you can see that the owner of the term on the right hand side in the bottom is APX, but the owner of the term of the top uh, terms here is uh, one of our partners. It's blackened out here but we can represent different owners of the term also with the same term ID. So um, we represent definitions of jurisdictions and owners under the same, under the same term ID, but uh, with different nodes in our data model. Oh, that was one too much. So let's have a look at um, a specific case in our data model. This is the jurisdiction again. So you saw on the last slide that we use relations for the jurisdictions. But recently, we also additionally introduced a property jurisdictions that we also use on the on the nodes for the definitions, in this case for establishment. And we introduced this property to make our queries faster uh, and also easier to read. So often we query for a concept that wanted to get the list of jurisdictions. We had to add a query an additional re relation until recently, but with properties, we found that uh, um, it works much faster. On the other hand, we still want to query the concepts for specific jurisdictions in some cases. So give me all the concepts for Mexico, for example. And this is um, something where we have now the two options that we can use, one for performance, the other for uh, queries for specific queries. On the next slide, you can see um, that we also support additional relations. So this is now what Gonzalo mentioned, uh, taxon uh, taxonomic relations that we support in our knowledge graph. Here you can see an example for narrow broader. So each term can have a broader term. In this case, establishment has broader terms for the um, product in which we use the term establishment, for example, processing, territorial scoping. 
would be a product. And also one broader term here in the bottom on the right hand side, you can see regulatory property option. This is the type of the term. So this is used in our tree as a regulatory property option with a specific name. Um, that is how we categorize our concepts. So here you can organize your data in a, in a tree-like uh, taxonomy. An additional taxonomic relation that we support, you can see here, this is related. So each term can have a related other concept. In this term case, it's the legal person in the center and legal person is related to signatory, debtor and other concepts that we have in the knowledge graph. So, but going beyond taxonomy now, we wanted to allow our users to define um, dynamic schemas. So this is a first step into a, the direction of an ontology. So um, here we got, we got inspiration from the ideas of ontologies. So in ontologies, you have the, um, the terminology domain and range. This plays a role, for example, for relations. You can restrict relations to a certain domain. Domain means where does the relation come from, which is the source of the relation. And range means the, where does the relation point to, which is the target of the, of the, um, of the relation. Uh, in our case, we um, use this idea to restrict uh, certain, um, yeah, again, relations in our case, but also what kind of properties we can add to our concepts. So we use the idea of a category. In our case, we assign a category to each concept. Um, this is optional. You don't have to assign a category, but um, normally we encourage it. So then each category it is itself a concept in the taxonomy. So you can edit the categories in the normal user interface and add additional nodes for categories. And then the user can use those categories to add specific properties or relationship that only works for concepts that are of a specific category that the user assigned. You will see an example. Um, and this is also how it normally works in ontologies. Um, so one example where we use this is where if uh, when we define an application. So here you can see our compliance app. One question in our compliance app that the user has to answer is about the place uh, of the data center and its of his office. And this question has several options. So you can see a select box here where the user can select several options. And we define this app in our knowledge graph. So we have a question concept somewhere, a question that we define, and we have the, the question options that uh, are also part of our knowledge graph. And let's see how this is now in our, uh, in our data model. So on the top, you can see now a concept establishment limb again, that has a different term ID. So this term ID is now specific for the application, for our compliance application, establishment limb DP data processing. And this has now a category here. You can see app question in the user interface. So the user assigned app question as a category. In our data model at the bottom, you can see that this term establishment limb DP data processing as a relation has category to the concept app question, which is our category. Um, you can also see that it's part of a taxonomy. So the data processing app uh, is there as a concept with narrow broader, narrower broader relations. And you can see an additional relation uh, on the going down to establishment limb. It's called has concept. I will get to that, what that means, but this connects the questions in our app to the um, concepts that we use in our rules, right? So the establishment limb is like a se second step in our rule. So now what can we do with this category app question? Here you can see now uh, an additional property that we want to add to any app question. This property is called question title. And this property now also has the category app question. On the, this is on the top. And if we add this to our database, then the term establishment limb DP data protection, because it's an app question, gets an additional field that you can see in the bottom. And the user can add a question title for this concept in our knowledge graph. 
Here's how it looks in, in Neo4j. So we have this, um, this node, establishment limit TP data protection. Now you have two additional properties here at the bottom, question help, question title, that we added for the app question category. We have also the option to add relations. Here, a relation has concept. This is this connection between the um, app questions and the uh, rule um, concepts. And here the user added a uh, relation has concept of category, again, app questions. So the source of the relation has to be an app question. And the range is empty in this case, which means it can connect to any uh, knowledge graph concept. But here the user could also restrict the range. And again, in the user interface to add a relation on the bottom, so at the term establishment limp DP data protection, you can add this relation has concept. And this is how the question now connects to the establishment limp in the, of the rule. So here you see it, uh, this relation in the, in the Neo4j database. So this is, is exactly this has concept relation that you already have seen on the, on the first slide. So how do we store this information in our database when the user adds relations or adds properties? Um, this is the data model for this ontology concept. So on the left-hand side, we have the red. In red, you have the property that the user added, question title. And again, we have a relation has category to the app question. So this restricts this property to the app question uh, concepts. And you have the has concept relation here in dark green with a label concept relation. And this has two relations, has category and has range um, that finally restricts the usage of this um, user defined relation. And now our service makes sure that the user can only add relations and properties to the defined domains and ranges. So with this, I will give back to my colleague, uh, Gonzalo, who will now explain more about the service architecture. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so uh, we want also to uh, introduce you to our service architecture. Um, our service architecture is follows a microservices uh, approach. So we have different microservices decoupled from each other. Uh, and we have more than the ones that are represented here. This is only a sample. But as you can see, we have uh, some dependencies, but most of them are uh, requesting the knowledge graph. And the knowledge graph is a very central module because it provides information about regulatory topics and legal content to all the other services. This knowledge graph service is then linked to Neo4j, which is our database and is also linked to Elasticsearch. Why do we use Elasticsearch? We use Elasticsearch uh, to obtain a better performance when executing full text searches. What we do with Elasticsearch is we store some basic nodes information on the Elasticsearch. And then when there is a complex full text search, we do the search against Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch will return the node IDs and with those node IDs, then we request Neo4j, which is much more simpler uh, and faster. As you can see also on the image, we use Kafka to communicate uh, events. This is because we use also an event-driven approach. Um, and this way we can subscribe to events, be notified uh, and be uh, synchronized with the, the other services. So in this slide, we explain why. Part of it I already mentioned. It allows us, uh, this um, event-driven approach allows us to, to be synchronized with all the other services. So we can register to topics. And once uh, we are notified about these topics, we can do our own processing, integrate the data the way we want to integrate in our graph. And then everything is linked. We can subscribe to be notified about uh, new company, companies that, that we are setting up in the APX world, about new rules that we are creating, about new rule sets that and products that we are supporting. And all this is combined together uh, in our graph. 
so with this approach we avoid for example direct circular dependencies we avoid to have uh, to share databases among the different services uh, and we don't need to go back and forth with direct requests because we just subscribe and then we are notified. This information that we gather and then we use and integrate in our graph can then be used to provide directly to the customer through our API, or we can just display it in our taxonomy. For example, the term usage is one of the things that we display. The user can easily know, okay, this term is being used in these rules uh, for these specific scenarios as an action property or a, a, as a regulatory property option or anything else. So um, it is very valuable uh, for the customers. With this, we end our presentation. I would like to say thank you to everyone that is listening to us. Uh, also, thank you to Mario and Rafael who helped us to prepare this uh, presentation. I also would like to mention that APX is hiring. So if you are interested in APX, please reach us through our emails. Um, and I sent it back to the host, Jared.